Welcome to a lovely episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to bring to you my dear friend, Laura Gitman. Uh, Laura um, is actually changing the world for better, uh, for real. Every startup uh, founder claims that Laura is Chief Impact Officer of Business for Social Responsibility, BSR. It's a global nonprofit organization that works with over 300 member companies, who is who of Global 2000. And um, Laura launched um, their financial services practice, has been uh, Chief Operating Officer, and knows everything um, you ever want to know about uh, th all things sustainability. Uh, in addition to her Stanford MBA, she now teaches at an MBA at Sustainability at Bard and at Duke uh, Fuqua School of Business. Laura, welcome to the pod. Thanks so much, Alex. It's wonderful to see you. Great to see you. Um, Laura, so, uh, you know, you were um, at the center of what some of the largest and most important organizations uh, in in the um, in, in the in a global economy are doing about you know making the world um, a better, fairer, juster place. It's a it's a highly sensitive uh, political area. Um, there's probably different opinions of what's appropriate and what's not. So tell us a little bit about how this works. Most people have not encountered an organization of that impact, maybe outside of you know World Economic Forum. And um, you know, you you know, just looking at the you know member organizations, you know, American Express, Coca Cola, and so on. It's just everybody um, knows these products and and um, and these brands. And so, tell us, you know, how did you bring them together, and what are you guys doing together? Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, well, we have been around for over thirty years, and interestingly, our mission has has never changed. So, our mission when we were founded was to work with business to create a just and sustainable world. And so that mission is more relevant than ever and perhaps was a, a bit prescient at the time. Um, but so everything we do is about working with the private sector. There are other organizations that work on sustainability from other angles, either from policy angles or from an advocacy angle. We work directly with business and particularly with big business. Um, because we believe they have the scale of impact and um, and the scale of ambition to be able to um, drive real sustainable change. Um, and so from that beginning, certainly the work that we've done with companies has evolved, but it's always been towards that that um, that same uh, aim. Um, so we work with companies in four real ways at the core mm -hmm. is a membership. And so companies are members of BSR. As part of the membership, they get um, lots of thought leadership, lots of advice, lots of opportunities for, for networking and collaboration. Um, we also do consulting with companies. And um, when we um, started our, our consulting work, um, we were kind of one of the only organizations that really were around that could provide that kind of advisory to companies. Now, every consulting firm in the world claims to, to do sustainability consulting. And so it's been sort of an, an interesting shift. And, and we tend to stay focused on sort of the leading edge work and, and where other players um, start to um, do a lot of work in advisory. We let them do that work and then we continue to move to that. So you let McKinsey edge. do the cookie cutter and you guys are doing the actual bleeding edge exactly. innovation? Is, okay, yep. got it. All right. Exactly. Um, and then we do what we call um, multi-company or um, or collaborative work um, where, you know, as a, as a nonprofit, we're actually able to bring together competitors um, to work together on particular issues. And so we can bring sort of a whole industry along um, or a whole value chain to solve a particular issue. Um, and then lastly, we, we do a um, grant funded work, which helps us to do research and thought leadership, um, again, on, on some of the, those cutting edge issues that may not be ready yet for a company to take on themselves, but they will need to in a few years. And so the, the grant funded work lets us um, do that kind of research and, and stay ahead. And so who's your primary um, audience, right? Like, like who do you engage with the you know, sustainability teams, uh, yeah, communication for the most teams? Part it's, it's, mm -hmm. For the most part, it's sustainability teams. And so where companies have a chief sustainability officer, that's the, the function. 
Um, but increasingly, it's also investor relation teams and it's also right. compliance teams. Um, it might be procurement when we're talking about supply chain issues. And so it varies a bit. And, and most companies have um, a board committee or a cross-functional committee that actually oversees these issues. And so we do a lot of work in some ways for, for that cross-cutting um, committee as well. And so this is actually one really interesting um, area because I think stereotypically when, when when people are interested in sustainability, they kind of want to join the sustainability team. But I have um, uh, a quote from you uh, from, from one of your lectures where you say, I encourage students to go into marketing, finance, or whatever they desire and to embed sustainability principles into their everyday work. And this is near and dear to my heart, to you know, we we have an audience of CEOs, marketers, uh, product leaders. Uh, some of them um, in their personal lives want to want to have sustainable impact, but many see opportunities to to do it in their everyday work. And so, what do you um, you know? What do you think for lay folks? Um, what do you think are like the best practices that they could bring this into? small organizations or large organizations or small organizations that support their large um, organizations um, in achieving their sustainability um, and ESG uh, goals. Yeah, thanks for, for bringing up that quote. I feel pretty um, strongly that um, you do not need sustainability in your title. And actually we're never gonna get there if the only people who think about sustainability are the people who have it formally in, in their title. So I think it very much needs to be embedded in, in the way you think about business. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what sustainability is at its core, it's thinking about your impacts and the way the world impacts you in a broader perspective, right? And mm -hmm. so rather than only thinking about the financial impacts and the financial inputs, it's thinking about a broader range of inputs, um, perhaps inputs that you don't pay for, but that um, that certainly the world pays for, um, and a broader range of, of outputs and impacts on the world. And so I encourage whatever function you're in, to think about um, sort of the, the process flows and the value chain of the work that you do and where you might have a broader set of impacts if you, if you simply expand the way of thinking about it. So if you're an engineer, thinking about materials and thinking about energy efficiency is a, is a prime way to, to think about sustainability. If you're a marketer, thinking about access to your products or thinking about how to communicate some of the sustainability attributes. Um, so I think it's important to simply think about where you have impact and, um, and, and to think about sustainability as well from the broadest perspectives. So when we think about it, we're not only thinking about environmental components. Some people these mm -hmm. days think about sustainability as only climate change, for example, but we'll think about it environmentally from both a climate change and a nature and a biodiversity perspective. Um, but also the the social impacts and the inclusivity yep. impacts and justice. And so really important to think about your employees, your the communities in which you operate, the um the customers and suppliers that are a part of um, your products. And so you can think about both the environmental and social impacts across that that whole suite of impacts. and And so some some skeptics, which you know are out there, will say, well, look, but, you know, these companies, they're large companies, let's say they're unnamed, they're talking about all this stuff, right? Or, or maybe some of them are not talking that much, but there, it's a lot of talk, a lot of talk, but then they go do whatever is profitable, right? So um, let's talk about walking the talk, right? And I have a great example of you guys walking the talk, which I'd love to, you know, celebrate. Um, was how you've, you're thinking about your own marketing and your own communications with your constituents. But, you know, look, t tell me a little bit, about how do you see um, some of your partners, um, you know, really embrace this and be congruent with the messages, with their goals and with their mission? Yeah. So first you said something that um, may be a misconception. So I want to maybe just clarify, and that is, um, that um, that they might talk about sustainability, but then they go do what is profitable. 
Um, and so I don't want us to imply that there needs to be a trade-off between those. Um, and, um, and it is perfectly acceptable for it to be profitable and sustainable. And I think um, you know, some of my students especially um, have a hard time with that. They think, well, if you're just doing this to be profitable or to make money, then it can't be sincere. I love it when a company does yeah. sustainability to be profitable because it means it's going to be sustainable and they're going to keep investing in it and it's not and just it's fact. good business to do good you know exactly. effectively so, yeah so and I'm, I'm personally i, I want to air out the devil's kind of point of view but like i'm you know when we were you know when when we when we first met i was at stanford um interning at salesforce and right like from the very beginning mark set out a uh, a mission, one of the core missions of the company was to be a different kind of business that's socially responsible. And I think uh, a lot of people were like, oh, this is BS. You know, he just wants to sell more software and nothing could be further from the truth, right? And having, you know, stayed in the Salesforce ecosystem, having had them as a customer and a partner, um, you know, we just admire how they are actually, you know, bringing not just themselves, right? But bringing the whole ecosystem of their of their partners their customers um to think about business as a force for good and it is one of the you know in in market cap terms the the you know single largest in a enterprise software accruer of a market cap you know, market cap in that time period so it, it's it's so it's very well. much yeah. it's a very much a success story so i um, you know, but that's an example that maybe, you know, is well known. What are some other examples uh, where you see companies just really, um, you know, co managing to combine it tremendously well? Yeah. And, and so we um, tend to avoid calling out individual companies as sort of doing yeah. really well um, as best case, because we think every company is on a journey. And I think that's the yeah. other answer to your question, right, is of course, there are no big companies who are 100% entirely sustainable um, mm -hmm. because they are, are moving massive machines and they have impacts right now. And so um, a lot of it is understanding where are their most material impacts. So um, what I don't like seeing is, you know, a healthcare company doing great on you know, purchasing renewable energy for their manufacturing, but not thinking about access to their medicine, right? Wonderful, important that they they procure renewable energy, but that's not their most important impact. And so, um, you know, we, we really look for companies to move the needle on the areas that are most, most material for them, that are core to who their business is. Um, and so um, companies that are setting ambition holding themselves accountable with, mm -hmm. you know, with targets of where they're looking to go and what the progress has been, being transparent around when they're not achieving that. So um, a lot of companies over the past five years have set science-based targets, for example, mm -hmm. on, on climate change, right? And they've said, okay, we're going to, we're going to align with the science. We're going to align with the global climate agreements. Um, in order to, to do our share to reduce global emissions. Um, but the conversations we're having with all of them right now who have set those targets is they don't know how they're going to get there um, right. because they are continuing to grow and they're continuing to um, increase their emissions, maybe not on a relative basis. They're making good progress on a relative basis, but it's still insufficient. Um, and so sort of collectively as an industry, we're looking at each other and saying, what, what needs to change in the system? Um, it's not that those commitments weren't sincere. It's not that those companies aren't trying. It's that they don't have all the levers to be able to make progress. And so I think that transparency and honesty around um, where are we making change and where where is it not enough? Um, and where do we as a system need to do better? That's That's where I get excited because I think um, that's that's a way of rethinking and in some ways reimagining capitalism, reimagining industry um, to sort of collectively achieve what we need to achieve um, to to have a sustainable future. So it's basically a you know if I put a rudimentary spin on it, it's you're you're trying to push people towards a Pareto optimal eighty twenty type of principles where they can have the most impact and then equip them with imagination and comparison uh, metrics of like, hey, here's for your industry, this is how you you know you can 
achieve your goals, right? Because the, like it's everybody's in a unique journey. Every company is in a unique journey. Every industry has its own set of constraints. Um, and even in the ESG rankings, right? Like their industry peers is a very important dimension. So it sounds like Absolutely. this is this is part of the value in your in kind of how you put the peers together in in related in related areas or across related functions. Absolutely. I think with the one exception that um, we can help them collaborate on. So it doesn't necessarily have to be done in a competitive way. Yeah. Um, you know, some of this progress can be done pre-competitively um, in order to, to move the whole system. And I, I love that. Um, and I, I we did notice that this is one of the great things as we were working with sustain, chief sustainability officers around their ESG communications, we noticed um that unlike some other departments, right, there's a much broader spirit of let's work together, let's let's kind of advance our industry together. And that was really wonderful feeling. So we've, you know, we've partnered a little bit, and this is kind of back to, to credit to you. It's like you've outlined that one of your goals is to be the thought leader and the kind of the, the spreader of ideas about what are what is, you know, uh, appropriate best practices or guidances you know, could look like. And, um, uh, you know, instead of, you know, pummeling people with a uh, print first type of content, you're looking to innovate, right? And get your, both your ideas in a, you know, more engaging way, but also deliver them in the, what we call green digital. And so you've been, you know, experimenting with that. Um, what kind of, when, when you look as a, you know, former CEO now as, you know, impact, impact officer, um, like, how do you look at where, do, you know, at your business, at your overall organization and make sure that you're congruent? Because I think to us, like one of the tragedies sometimes is like, hey, you know, I'm very exciting. Just look at this very boring hundred page presentation about how exciting I am. Or I'm very sustainable. You know, here's a you know couple of trees that we killed to print out this report. Right. And and um, it's it's sad because I think. When people reflect on it, you kind of instantly feel like a lot of credibility is lost. And sometimes you, you don't even have the opportunity to get to the message. And so I, I think I want to celebrate that you're kind of really open to trying this out. And what what else are you trying to do to get your message across in a way that's congruent with your mission and supports your audience uh, of, of partners yeah. in the world? Well, and thanks, Alex, and um, and we've been really pleased to to be able to partner with you in in that journey. It's we are not an organization that that thinks about um, that kind of innovation or communication first, right? That we don't have a a big team to be able to to do that, and so um, making it easy and being able to to partner um, with Relato has been just just fantastic. Um, we we think about thought leadership as a really critical part of how we achieve our mission. So we can't, you know, we're we're thrilled to have the membership that we have, um, mm -hmm. but it's less than 350 companies, right? And so while they're they're big and influential companies, it's still just a, a fraction of the the kind of companies that need to be able to understand what's happening in the field, understand its evolution and, and be able to learn from one another. And so it's really important to us to be able to get out content um, in a way that um, is, is usable and, and actionable by our members, but also by, um, by the private sector more broadly. And, um, you know, we, we stopped printing things a long time ago. So we, we moved away from paper, um, but I don't know that we necessarily got anywhere in terms of engagement, right? So certainly lots of posting of PDFs, emails that don't get opened um, and, um, and content that maybe, you know, someone would need to spend a lot of time reading and therefore never share with their colleagues and other functions. And so right. um, for, for us, really important that we figure out how to make content more digestible, how to make it more searchable, more practical, um, and ideally shareable so that yeah. when, you know, our, our core counterpart reads some of our thought leadership, they send it on to their procurement teams and their IR teams and their CFO. Um, we want it to get to different parts of the organization to have the impact it's going to have. And that's not going to happen if it's done in, um, you know, as you say, sort of a, a 90 page report that sits on a website. And so really been um, it's been fun to try to innovate 
Um, the other thing that we do is we have um, really evolved our approach to events um, mm -hmm. and really try to lean into events that are way more interactive. Um, you know, there's lots of conferences out there with a panel of people all speaking about their best practices and showing essentially the same PowerPoint presentation. We have no interest in doing those kinds of events, um, but we do do events where we bring together our members in a much more interactive way to actually solve problems together. And so, again, how do we share that experience in a way beyond the people who get to to, to participate um, is another way where we're really trying to, to innovate in terms of how we how we share that thought leadership so that others get to, to benefit as well. Well, and I think what you've highlighted is really like, you know, for anybody who cares about impact in the kind of broader sense of the world, what you've meant, what you mentioned, and we've seen this in with our ESG clients, is that um, the impact only works if it sort of goes across the organization, right, and across the supply chain in some cases, right, and across, um, uh, across you know, the the even the customers appreciating why a company is making certain decisions. And that just doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? So you like the the that ESG or whatever report, internal report, external report that gets kind of read by an analyst somewhere. That's you know a step, but it's not it, it at all doesn't you know accomplish the mission of galvanizing you know broad set of uh, you know audiences to do something differently, right? And if anything, you guys are trying to do to get the world to think differently, to act differently. And then you brought up the the, the majority of the, the narrow audience is not the always the audience. You need to enable your super champions and your super experts and the people who have sustainability maybe in their title to get this message out to everybody else, right? To get this and you know various messages, right? And the message is very different from you know uh, you know social issues to sustainability issues, you know to some folks governance issues you know, different personas from investors to, you know, your entire team and, you know, community uh, of customers. So how do you find that was, you know, your agenda is very broad, right? It involves, you know, pretty much the whole spectrum of, of um, organizations activity. How do you get the right um, message to the right audience? Uh, that's not like, not your perfect target, but like, you know, the expanded circle of influence. Yes, it's, it's I, I wish I had the, the, the perfect answer to that because I think that's in some ways the, the holy grail. Um, I, I think part of it is getting more specific. Um, and so, you know, the, the work we do on human rights in tech product development is not going to be of interest to our apparel company who's looking at labor issues in their supply chain. Um, and so being honest about what the content is and getting specific so that it is really relatable and, and practical for um, for the audience. And so, if you are, um, you know, in product development and, and a technology company, and thinking about the ethical and human rights impacts of the technology you are developing, you want content that speaks exactly to that. And it yeah. doesn't have to matter what your title is, but you know that the content is really relevant and the examples are going to be relevant. And so, getting away from sort of the general you know, sustainability is important content that we see right. a lot of and much more specific to um, the, the particular issues and the particular industries that they are relevant for. So some of our best content are, are, are primers for particular sectors on, on specific issues. Um, I think so so peanut things, butter is yeah. not thought leadership, basically, is what you're saying. Real thought leadership is, yes, you need an umbrella, maybe a framework, but then you need to drill in and really own, you know, particular domain, whether it's industry specific or function specific. Yeah. And for, for us, that has been, we've really leaned into our areas of expertise. And so for us, that's, that's climate, that's nature, that's human rights, it's um, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, and then what we would call more broadly sustainability transformation, right? So that's sort of the nuts and bolts of the governance and board engagement on sustainability. Um, but getting specific on the issues and getting specific on um, on how they relate to particular industries has been really helpful for us. I think the other thing that has been really helpful is um, helping companies to make sense of 
the plethora of other communications out there. And so in some ways we are a curator and an interpreter. Um, you know, there's a lot happening in the regulatory space in Europe, for example, and it yeah. is incredibly overwhelming for companies. Um, and so being ab able to distill from that what really matters to you and, and how what are the implications for different functions that tends to get um, very well received and, and, and really um, touch on what companies need to know now. So it's timely. Um, and um, and related to um, you know specific changes that are coming and specific changes that they need to be able to make. Yeah, this is a very interesting challenge that we encounter in these large, complex organizations that tend to be your 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 clients as well. Um, we see that on the one hand, uh, they especially in European countries, right, like where there's more technical approach to things, right. There's a strong desire to have detailed documentation. And then, you know, as you mentioned, there's regulatory environment that provides plenty of that. Uh, but uh, the senior decision makers, uh, even any decision makers, they feel overwhelmed by that. So they, on the one hand, they want the the details, but they need the summary and then the the, the ability to provide the, the details and have the evidence backing up the summary is what makes a difference in, in sort of helping especially around areas of compliance, which are kind of, you know, you can't just go and, you know, improvise on, on, on these sort of topics. So um, how do you, how do you deal with that challenge of combining robustness and almost scientific approach to, you know, to kind of keeping the evidence, letting people find the context uh, to, with the, simplification right uh, yeah. it feels like it's essential in any sort of field but I, I you know having read the 200 page esg reports was like 300 page appendixes and then they're all part of like overall integrated report which could be even larger like you know it feels very challenging just to navigate through that even for people who have the best intentions uh in mind have what have you found that works uh, in breaking through that, kind of finding those nuggets in the noise, but not losing the context. Yeah, um, so I, I think you're right. I think it's a huge challenge. And, and when we think about our own team, um, making sure that we have both the breadth and the depth that you're describing, right? So um, not only do you need to be able to, to pull up a level and be able to understand sort of organizationally what matters most, but also to be able to see the intersection points between the issues, right? And so there, you know, when you only speak to sort of the functional detail, you could be a climate person who doesn't really pick their head up to think about, oh, this actually connects to the justice issues that my colleagues are talking about, right? And so being able to pull up, but also to see the intersection points is, is where we spend a lot of our time helping companies um, navigate and 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 understand i think um there are a a lot of new data tools there's a lot of focus on sort of the detailed compliance level data gathering um that's not necessarily where we're going to add value we think there's a lot of opportunity for companies to take advantage of different data providers and and to to do the number crunching and to get to the specific details what we want to do is be able to pull up and help companies think more strategically about where they're actually going to be able to create value from all of that. And so be able to, they need to be transparent, they need to have the data, they need to monitor progress, but what does that add up to? Um, and mm. what does that mean in terms of their strategic direction? And, and we want to focus more on, okay, across all of that, really, where are the big risks and big opportunities for you as a company? Um, because a lot of the data is, is again, important to measure progress, but it's not moving the needle on, um, on truly material um, strategic direction. A few issues are. And so a company needs to be able to, 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 to pull up from across all of that data that, again, is important and needs to be there, but it, it's a separate conversation as to, to where are you creating value. So, so great. Let's pull up a little bit at a global level. Now you've been looking at the space before it became popular and and uh, you know buzz buzzy. Uh, 18, 18 years or so. Yeah, it's um, crazy. So um, 
I want to come back maybe to some personal reasons why you chose chose this and why do you describe yourself as a pragmatic idealist? Um, but you know, there's this global um, variety, right? Like, so we, we were meeting up in Paris the other the other day. We were talking about you know the the how the French companies have separate regulatory pressures than from from the U.S. companies. Um, there's the um, uh, political cultural environments where which is leading you know from terms like you know greenwashing to green hushing and these are sort of some of the you know buzzwords that are coming up where people are not as vocal about some of the initiatives that they're taking um so guide us a little bit on what you're seeing you know across this you know amazing portfolio of the most important organizations uh business organizations in the world what are what are the trends that you know folks that are you know not as close to this uh, could should be staying on top of yeah um it's a good question and it's been sort of a fascinating couple of years in the space because it's my answer is very different than it might have been um you know even two to three years ago um one i'll say is companies want glo a global company needs global certainty right and so they can't have a different approach in every region they need to be able to manage their their global business and so in some ways the regulations from the European market, um, which are similar, I will say, to what California is putting in place, and so it's not only um, um, only Europe, but um, but but largely Europe, um, are driving what most global companies are doing anyway, um, okay. because they, you know, whether they're headquartered in Europe or simply have sufficient sales or, or revenue to 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 be covered by the laws. Most global companies, um, you know, are are impacted by the European regulations and are therefore shifting their approach to be able to comply with the European regulations. So that's changing. You know, I just came back from Japan, and the first question I got from every Japanese company I talked to was, "What do I need to know about the European regulations?" And so it's it's that's driving sort of a global increase in standards and an mm -hmm. expectation around what companies need to do, regardless of where they're located. Um, then you've got sort of the, the regional flavors, which may be different in terms of how they might market it, um, what mm -hmm. they might focus on beyond what's required. But the compliance regulations are, are fairly sophisticated. So they are not a low bar or a low expectation, um, but actually really pushing um, fairly advanced commitments and expectations, not just for um, you know, being transparent about data, but actually being transparent around what activities and what kind of due diligence you are doing. So it, it used to be, you'd be in compliance to say, I'm not doing anything. And that would be in compliance as long as you, you know, were transparent about that. That is no longer sufficient. So now you actually have to be able to describe your human rights due diligence, your due diligence on um, environmental components. And so companies have to act. It's not gonna be- So the compliance is act. drive, so, so sorry to interrupt, but it feels like compliance is driving communications anyway. Um, Correct. And and actions, right? Like you know, so be like some kind of actions, at least some communications. So you can't really escape this. With you a, cannot escape like, it. The, the floor, yeah, the floor, the floor has is up. You don't have to market it to your consumers. Yeah. Um, but you you've got to you've got to have a pretty high high baseline of, of communication. I what about US, marketing it to investors, right? Like, is in because that's a very different audience. Um, yeah. Investors, you know, within that, also, there's two, yeah, yeah, tell us. Yeah, we haven't seen any slowdown on what investors want. So, um, you know, the, the ESG investing or sustainable investing has been booming for the past couple of years. It drove a lot of, you know, prior to the, the new regulations, most of the progress in, in sustainability was driven by investor demand, investor and, and sort of big corporate customer demand. Um, and investors, despite the current political situation in the U.S., have not really pulled back. Um, so they're still expecting more and more. Um, and they've, they've learned that getting ESG data is just a better way to understand how companies are managed and understand their risks. And so um, they're not pulling back either. Um, the only real pullback we've seen is in sort of the more public communications in the U S mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. um, because of some of the political backlash. Um, but I, I think that will continue at least through next year's election. Um, 
where companies maybe historically felt um, like they needed to, to stand up more and be more public around some of their efforts and now are worried that they'll get backlash and um, and that, you know, by pursuing one group of customers, they're they're upsetting another group of customers. And so um, there's a little bit less of that, but the investor communications and the investor engagement um, and the compliance engagement, those are both full steam ahead. And so for those of us that are less familiar with that, so when we say investor, right, like there, there is um, sort of asset allocators, right, in there, um, and then there's asset allocators for those asset allocators. So guide us a little bit of what you're seeing. Where's the where's the pressure really coming from? Is it the sovereign wealth fund um, that kind of invests in in various private equity, you know, or other or other you know you know asset uh, asset managers? Is it um, is it the pension funds? Uh, you know, f- or organizations that are you know university endowments that are kind of historically maybe in the in the technology community they've they've been very influential investors are they driving this agenda and it's kind of dropping down to to the individual um you know asset allocators kind of that are making the direct investments guide us a little bit of what the dynamic is there because it feels like it's more you know interplay of different of different pressures uh that's happening yeah, simultaneously I, I think it's coming from across the board so i think um you know, maybe 10 years ago, it was coming from European pension funds and, um, okay. and, and European um, sovereign wealth funds, but, um, but, but now it's across the board. So certainly um, pension funds, both university, but also private foundations, family foundations, um, you know, big sort of state pension funds that are saying, you know, if, if we are, our, our fiduciary responsibility is to think long-term. Um, And so we can't be so focused on short-term returns. We need to make sure that the investments we're making are aligned with our long-term aspirations. And so I'd say any institution that has that long-term perspective, any long-term investor um, really across the board has shifted towards more of of an ESG mandate. Um, I think the second thing are younger um, retail investors, right? And so as investors have... um, gotten younger over time, um, they have started to say, we, we want, we care about the values that are Mm -hmm. um, represented in how we invest our money. Um, And as they've gotten more wealth um, and started to demand new products, you've seen asset managers sort of respond with a a, a slew of new products that incorporate um, ESG factors into um, into their investment decisions. So it's both sort of big institutional investors, but increasingly also um, sort of a, a broader set of investors who are, are are pushing it as well. So, right. And so just, just, so like we historically, when people think retail investors is like, I go and sign up and have my account and I pick a certain stock. But what you're saying is actually retail investors that still go through a mutual fund or some other Kind of um, stock index, in yeah, or yeah. whatever. They they have an increasingly a choice uh, when they're either picking their employee benefits and other things to pick the types of options that are in line with their values, their organization's values, and so on. Correct. Yeah. So they okay. they've demanded new products, and the industry has has responded with developing those products, and that's yeah, not going to change. They might change see... what they're called, right? But right. they but the substance isn't going to change. And, and we're seeing this in the earlier stage in community and private equity and venture community where there's a lot more due diligence kind of around those factors as well. So it's sort of, it's trickling down from the larger institutions, you know, in, into smaller organizations as well. So, so now, did you expect that like uh, this is going to play out? Like, you know, take yourself back to, you know, fresh out of, uh, Stanford GSB just starting was was BSR. Um, what, what what did you expect the journey would be like? You know, the, the, towards the world that we're in today was it, it it was a chaotic kind of at the time, and that you were kind of one of the few misunderstood kind of um, uh, folks. And uh, now it's like really empowering that you see you know entire community built. Or did you expect that this would uh, be just a question of time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it might be a little bit of both. So certainly, um, 
it took way longer than I expected. So I, I was not expecting to spend so many years just trying to explain why this mattered. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, I, I thought that would be quicker, candidly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember writing a, a research report what year was that? Maybe 2010 on, you know, ESG investment is just good investments. Um, and it took kind of another decade before the, the investment community really got there. And, and that's not to give kudos to myself. It's actually to say, my God, what happened over those 10 years, right? Why did it, why did it take so long? Um, so I think that I was pretty convinced early on that this was good business um, and that we didn't have a choice, right? I mean, I think the, um, you know, if you think about, you know, the the number of companies that are actually the world's largest countries, if, if we were to compare them in terms of, mm -hmm. of GDP, um, you know, companies are more global than, right. than countries. Companies um, depend more on the well-being of society um, than many countries. And so um, it was no question to me that companies needed to think differently um, about their risks and opportunities and to start to incorporate sustainability aspects in order to run a good business. So that was pretty clear. Um, I think it, as I said, it took longer, I think, to, to get wider acceptance there. I was not prepared for the backlash. Um, so I was not prepared for, um, you know, the, the past two years where in the U.S., you know, governments that typically say, you know, let business make their own decisions and um, and let investors make the best decisions they want to suddenly say, except you can't consider ESG. It, it feels sort of counterintuitive to to um, a, a free market. Um, and so that that I was not prepared for. I wasn't prepared for the politicization um, that we've seen. Um, I don't think it's you know, in, in some ways, maybe I should have been right. Once you get more mainstream, you get a backlash before it becomes before it becomes truly integrated. And so maybe, maybe this is a bump we need to to go through. But uh, but that I certainly wasn't prepared for. Well, and and I think this really this ties to kind of your your self description as a pragmatic idealist, right? Like, how do you navigate this, right? Like, is it like this conversation is very practical, right? We're going into mm -hmm you know, a lot of, you know, normal discussions. We're not like waving a flag of particularly of, you know, one, one set of beliefs or another, you know, there is, there's an underlying uh, mission, but you're, you're very, you know, focused on, you know, tactics and strategy and getting things done. Is that, um, you know, is, is that a, uh, modus operandi in the in in the world that you live in, or are you more of an exception that you're applying? You know this very pragmatic um, approach. You you actually you know your your clients pay you right, like you're not just kind of collecting donations, right? Like you're actually mm -hmm. creating a lot of value um, for the members uh, for specific consulting projects. Um, so, so like, it feels like it's a very, you know, well-run, thoughtful, uh, grassroots, but, but business oriented approach to getting good things done. Tell me more, like, is, is everybody like that at BSR? Is, is that, you know, is everybody like that in the broader ecosystem? So everybody is certainly not like that in the broader ecosystem. Um, I do think, and I think part of why I've been at BSR so long is because, um, it is, really core to our culture and our theory of change. And so I think we have a unique value proposition that happens to align with the way I see the world and 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 how um, how I think we're going to get things done in in terms of the you know corporate sustainability. Um, so it's very much a BSR um, mo, but it's it's not in the field. Um, and what we find in the field more typically are um, one of two things, those who are only doing this because there's business opportunity. And again, there's there's value in that. Um, but that becomes a little bit of telling a company what they want to hear and not being willing to push them um, to be more ambitious and to, ha to have the kind of impact that they, that they could have. Right. So if you're only doing it from a pure business perspective, I think it stops short of the systemic change and the kind of ambition that's necessary. Um, so we are proud of the fact that we you know, we have to earn our living, right? So we don't do get donations. Um, mm -hmm. We 
we we advise companies and they pay us for what we do, but they also pick us because we're going to push them and we're going to tell them the truth and we're going to lay it out in terms of the context of what society needs. We're not only going to tell them what they want to hear. Um, so that's the sort of the business only side. The other side is a little bit more of a, a think tank or an advocacy organization that, from my perspective, takes too much of a, pu a purist view. Um, so uh, they'll only work with the companies that already are committed. Um, they won't work with the companies that maybe have have some black spots um, or um, need to really change their business model. Um, or they might put out a lot of thought leadership, but don't actually know how to get it done. And we don't believe okay. in putting out thought leadership that's not about action. Um, and so there's a there's a role for that. There's a role for advocates. There's a role for for thinking. There's there's even a role for some of those purists. But um, we're not going to put blinders on and and only work with the very small percentage of companies that that you could argue are already integrated and sustainable because that's not moving the mainstream of business. And we're never going to get there if we don't move move industry. So um, we work with you know, and you can pick your your favorite company to hate on, right? We we work with big pharma or big food or big ag or, you know, uh, I don't know what they're calling tech these days, sort of the, the big evil tech companies, right? So we, we work with whatever, whatever industry some of those advocates like to, to criticize because we know that that's where real industry is. That's where the jobs are. That's where the impacts are. Um, and yeah, so we're going to be practical about being willing to work with them in service of our mission. We're not going to work with them to to cover up bad acts, but we will work with them to, to, to truly change and, and to achieve our mission. Yeah. Change, change happens. Not, not just on the edges, right? Like you may be, you may be yeah. started on the edges, but you, we've sort of reached a level where it has to be in the mainstream at this point. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the exciting part. So let's say we're, you know, have an audience of mainstream entrepreneurs, mainstream, you know, marketing or communication leaders. And they want to do two or three things differently, right? And you, let's keep it not industry specific, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, what would be, you know, your playbook, right? Like they, they don't have a chief impact officer yet um, in that organization, like, 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 you know, BSR is fortunate to have you. So they have to be the chief impact officer. I, I feel like I am the chief impact officer at Relate to. Fortunately, you know, we're mission driven, but you know, guide somebody how to come infuse this in a way that, um, you know, it's a small step. It's a baby step in the right direction without a title, without a lot of dedicated uh, resources, but it, it, you know, you got to start somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. What would be your top, you know, top, top few tips? Yeah. So I, I think about where you can have the biggest impact, right? So I'd look mm -hmm. at, at, you know, your, your industry sector, your company, where you're operating, um, where you're trying to drive change, and think about where where you have the most opportunity for impact, right? And you know, you could look at the different topics as a way to just make sure you've scanned the different areas, right? So you can think about, okay, is it is it about climate? Is it about nature? Is it about um, the human rights and social impacts? Is it about inclusion? Um, but think, pick one, right? And and pick an area where. Um, you think your company is best positioned to drive change. Um, so that'd be the first thing. And that's sort of the opportunity angle. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would do is I would build in from the start, making sure that you have thought about your negative impacts, right? So there's how can you have the most positive impact? But mm -hmm. I build in from the start ways to make sure that you are set up to minimize your negative impacts because it is a lot harder to wait until you are 10 years old and much bigger to now try to undo harm it is much easier to make decisions up front and have the right policies approaches etc to prevent sort of negative impacts so I'd, I'd come from both of those angles and and do a scan and say okay what do we need to do whether it's you know putting in a certain hiring policy or thinking about accessibility of your products or mm -hmm. making a decision around what data center you're going to use to make sure it's a data center yeah. that that um, uses renewable energy for example right make those decisions right from the get-go so that they are easier to scale um, it's harder to rip out. up something that's you know, been embedded. Yeah. And I, I think that's yeah. very appropriate, right? If if you're 
if you're more efficient um, than an average website in terms of CO2 consumption, you know, as part of that initial decision, and then you don't have to go and rip out, you know, AWS for Azure or something so like that. So much harder later. Which is yeah. harder yeah. later. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what about communications, right? Like obviously communications is near dear to us. Is this all about like a regular cadence I think, you know, a lot of leaders have to repeat the same message multiple times in multiple ways um, and, you know, make it feel like it's the not their message, but it's something that kind of gets really adopted. What do you see the most um, successful individual leaders do, you know, to to get, you know, their passion, you know, and the strategies that we described just now to get it across? Yeah, it's... Um... So as you say, I think it needs to be authentic. Um, and so they need to be able to describe why it's good for the business. If it looks like it's a side pet project, it's gonna be received as a side pet project. So um, being able to speak about it in the language of your particular business, in the language of your customers and, and your you, you, USP is really important. Um, and so I think leaders who, who get it, um, maybe don't use the word sustainability, Right, they use the words that are are relevant to to who they mm. are and and what they're trying to accomplish. I think the other thing is to think about communications not as a one way um, push, but to to really allow for for input and dialogue. And so I think the companies that do it well um, mm -hmm. don't think about this as as a one directional communication, but 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 about engagement. Right, it's an right. opportunity to. Put information out there so that your employees, your customers, your business partners can realize the opportunities to to help yeah. you um, and to to give ideas and to innovate and to collaborate. And that's yeah. that's where it gets really exciting. So yeah, so we want a kind of a concrete example that jumps to mind when we see some internal communications about various either social or sustainability initiatives. You know, a very simple thing of like embedding a form that is actually allows people to nominate success stories or tell that or kind of sign up for projects or initiatives immediately transforms it from information that gets forgotten if it if it ever gets consumed to okay well you know i can influence the next report i can be um our, our project is doing something great you know let's recognize the people that are driving this initiative um, and I think that it feels like a lot of corporate initiatives have historically been very command and control uh, structure. Yeah. And so what you're saying is for meaningful change to happen and to, for this to feel like it's truly authentic to the entire organization, people need to find their own words, their own initiatives. Am I hearing this correctly? Yeah, it's, it's really validating, right? To say, oh, I, I contribute to that, right? So I'm not just hearing something and forgetting it but I see my own connection. And again, that can be within employee teams, but it could also be, you know, your community partners or your supply right. chain or your customers, right? If, yeah. if as a customer, I see how I am a part of your journey and your impact, that that's gonna feel good, right? That's gonna feel validating and I'm gonna wanna continue to invest in that partnership. Amazing. Well, Laura, thank you so much for sharing uh, what you've done, what you're working on, being so authentic and uh, being true to to your passion um, was driving, you know, business driven social change and social responsibility. How can people find what you guys are up to at BSR, engage with you personally? Tell us a bit yeah. about that. So you can you can come find us at BSR.org. Um, all of our thought leadership is publicly available there. So we, we really want it to be as, as widely um, utilized as possible. You can sign up for our newsletters. Um, you can contact any of our team members. So if there's particular industries or areas of expertise that you're interested in, um, BSR.org is sort of a, a good one-stop shop for, for everything that we do. Amazing. Thank you, Laura. Absolutely. Thank you, Alex.